to say anything, it is on record. It's now being recorded, so don't say anything that you wouldn't want said publicly. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't want uh, disseminated publicly, but not that uh, you know a lot of people are uh, looking at the uh, recordings. So here we are, an exciting and crazy time, probably scary and also, especially for me in New York City, it's uh, problematic to say the least. So we start off by uh, talking about the uh, antitrust policy. As you know, participation in these meetings has to respect the hyperledger antitrust policy. Anyone who does not agree to this, please leave the meeting. Um, the other thing is code of conduct. Basically, it says that we treat each other with respect, even when we are disagreeing with people or even agreeing with people, don't say anything nasty. These are the only two rules we operate under. The meeting is completely open. Um, and I was just talking to Michael uh, Castillo, who's on the meeting, so, He's listening in. Uh, also, let's go down the list here. Uh, and please introduce yourself uh, with a 20 second sort of uh, pitch on why you are here and what excites you. Bobby? Hi, I'm Bobby. Mascarif. I'm from the Learning Materials Working Group. Uh, my main goal is we're working on a project to gather use cases for the community. So I'm here to help out with your project use case page in case you have any interesting use cases you want to share with the community. And I'm also interested in how everyone's doing. Hi, Vipin. Uh, Jim. Hi, I'm Jim. Um, I work with Bobby and the Learning Materials Learning Group, Learning Group, and still interested in use cases as well. Um, and uh, look forward to what use cases we can find out of this group as well. So, thank you. Karen, oh, I don't want to call you, call on you right away. Uh, let's go down the list. Kelly probably doesn't want to talk because she's probably taking notes. Uh, then we come to money. You want to say something, money? Yeah. Uh, by the okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Manny for Life from Swap Sub. Um, we are, you know, engaged in building digital assets for the capital markets. Um, the full life cycle system. So, you know, one of the things that we are looking at is to adopt uh, the new token taxonomy framework uh, with hyperledger basis. So that's the project that we are currently undertaking. And uh, Wipin and I are working on this. And you know, we welcome contributions from others. Um. Michael, in case you want to say anything, you can do so because more people are here. Hi, thanks. I'll just uh, pipe in. Michael Del Castillo here. I'm uh, associate editor at Forbes. Um, been following Hyperledger from the very beginning. Um, I'm interested to learn more about what you guys are doing. And um, I'm mostly here uh, to sort of um, learn the materials. Uh, I, I would imagine that if I do end up doing any articles 
um, you would hear from me um, with a more formal request to, to talk on the record. Um, though uh, Bippin made it clear that this conversation is on the record, uh, I don't want to discourage a free exchange of ideas. So, um, you know, please don't, uh, don't, don't be concerned about my presence here and uh, you, you could expect to hear from me with a, a follow-up question if anything does happen. Yeah, it's on the record in, in so far as it's recorded and put on the Hyperledger Wiki. Uh, the next person is Sean. I'm very glad to see you here. Um, hello, uh, my name is uh, Sean Young. I'm working on a new Stability compiler called Solang, and um, I was I'm kind of interested in this group, so I thought I'd join. All right, Karen. In case you want to say anything. Hi, this is Karen. I'm part of the Hyperledger staff, um, and excited to see um, some new faces in the group today. Yeah. So. Before we go dive further into the Ethala project, I want to talk about the Capital Markets SIG a little bit because uh, Capital Markets are the, what I call the OR use case of blockchain. The first ever use case is payments, which is definitely part of um, the Capital Markets umbrella and we formed this group about six months ago or maybe even a little more time flies uh, the rationale was to talk about all the different aspects of the capital markets and see where blockchain applies and in particular hyperledger uh, technologies so we have come a long way we started with the taxonomy which talked about the structure of the instruments of capital markets we already published one it's available on our projects page uh, the second thing we talked about was a bunch of different projects that people were interested in. Some of them obviously have fell by the wayside, but many of them are still active and alive. They include things like regulations, which is very important capital markets, standards. Uh, and if I bring up my uh, page on the projects that we, uh, on the projects, then I can show you something more about the details of all the projects that we do, uh, that we are, that we have started. It doesn't mean that uh, we are anywhere with, some of them are very vast. Um, so I'm gonna share a screen about the projects. Uh, Just give me a second. Sorry, it's taking a couple of minutes here. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. yeah. All right, thanks. So like I was uh, saying, we have the taxonomy, the standards, uh the use cases which is where you you might come in uh bobby uh obstacles which uh which uh, 
was a proposal by uh, Kelly. That means what are the things that are standing in the way of uh, doing capital markets project at scale in enterprises today. Uh, then we have the regulation. Ron had uh, brought up a huge book that uh, gathered all of the different regulations from various areas of the world, various sovereign nations, various other agencies uh, like FATF and others. Uh, the next one is like obviously the one that we are going to focus on today, the top tokenization and digital currency uh, uh, work and the oracles was some something proposed by Wei Chong Neo. Uh, not not much work has happened in that, but oracles are very important because it basically talks about how to get off-chain data into smart contracts into the ambit of the chain itself, so that we can um, we can be sure what the data the data that's coming through is good and secure. Uh, this is a non-trivial problem. And uh, many proposals have been uh, made for that. Now, we come to the main section of the project, which is to talk about Ethaler, which is a uh, project that we proposed for modeling a central bank digital currency. Uh, we are following it from the uh, TTF. TTF is a token taxonomy framework, which was started under uh, Ethereum Enterprise Alliance. I mean, too many words there, but basically they are trying to standardize how a token is defined. When we come to the Ethaler project and look at the token formula, we can see how it uh, becomes uh, important to think about a token as a composable set of behaviors and subsequently what those behaviors uh, turn out to be in terms of implementation, uh, meaning to have a certain behavior like transferable or any other kind of behavior, you have to finally implement it uh, with an interface and the interface has a certain signature, as we say in, uh, in programming, and that those have to be a, met and interfaces are contracts basically contracts uh, between the implementation and the outside world. And the contract says that this particular uh, behavior in order to be implemented must have these functions and the function signature has to be so-and-so. So it freezes that, uh, that outside, that, contract with the outside world, which of course goes a long way towards interoperability, towards all these other properties that we are looking for. Now, I'm gonna stop sharing this screen and I'm gonna come up with another screen, which is uh, a, um, a set of slides that I developed and, uh, you know, so I want to say that um, that I'll that we'll go through that. But before that, I want money or anyone else to talk about what's happening with the Ethala project and why is this important today? Because if you if you if you had read the House bill uh, that was created just a few days. ago, 
couple of days ago, obviously you couldn't read the whole thing because it's a 1400 page document. Uh, uh, but there are some significant uh, things in there which are to dealing with the QE for the people and why is a central bank digital currency important there. They do talk about uh, giving a check to every American, well, under with certain constraints. And the way to distribute it is through a digital wallet. And they also talk about issuing the currency onto a blockchain. But obviously, this is not going to happen for this particular distribution, which is in the form of a QE to the people. Um, of course, the QE to the others is about three times as large, meaning, or even four times as large, because uh, you know the standard QE is still going on. Uh, in any case, the whole uh, concept of CBDC seemed to have gotten an imprimatur from the House Finance Committee. That's that's a significant step. And I had argued that such crisis situations always produce uh, new ideas and acceptance, more importantly, acceptance of new ideas that will live on long after the coronavirus has burned through the world. So that's why this eTeller project is important. Uh, I'm gonna pause the share here um, and I'm gonna bring up a new, um, new document. But before that, as, does anybody else have anything to say about this? Hi, Beth and Jim. Just quickly, um, the there was a good article. I'll post it in the chat. But it was an interesting um, series of points. The author was arguing why do we need a digital currency when we already have one uh, in the U.S. specifically. And so um, it's it doesn't say that you don't need one. What it is is you go through the points. You realize, um, and it, it makes you think differently about concepts of like a central bank digital currency here in the U.S. specifically. So I'll just post the link in the chat for reference. A lot of people talk a lot of uh, stuff about this uh, without truly understanding what a central bank digital currency is. I argue that there is no digital currency issued by the central bank today. Okay, uh, I don't, I don't know what this person says, but digital currency is there certainly, but it is issued by the regular banks, meaning. It's a deposit, your, all your deposits are digital. All the credit card transactions you do are digital. You don't hand anybody fiat currency, but it always comes with an intermediary. And that's where the counterparty risk is tremendous, right? Because the digital cash sitting in your account is protected by uh, FDIC only up to a certain amount right uh, and so what is standing in the back of all of this and it's tied to a bank if if the bank goes bankrupt the FDIC has to move your um, currency to some some other bank uh, and I don't know how it how it works how they give you that money the bank goes bankrupt. Um, You're right about it. I used to know an FDIC regulator that actually was, he was the guy that would close down a bank. And you're right about the process that you wind up in a sense taking the accounts that exist, you pick them up literally and wind up in a sense ultimately moving them to another bank, but only for the amount, max amount of what's insured um, per individual in that yeah, bank. So uh, the difference with the CBDC is that it is not 
any of those things, right? It's in the end, it is uh, backed just like a dollar is by the, by the central bank, wherever it is. Um, so the backing actually doesn't change. I think the mechanics do though. You're correct. I would agree with you very much on the idea it's that- It's not just the mechanics. It is the fact that if you're holding it in your wallet, there is no, nothing standing between you and the central bank guarantee like in a regular dollar. Of course, you can say the central bank can go under, in, in which case, of course, no, you know, I mean, coordination. Central bank, you're right, that's a very low risk, obviously, but the, the other point- Lower is, uh, than a bank going under or lower than any, anything else. So anyway, yeah. let's not argue about this yeah. here because I think many people are misinformed about this and they make all kinds of arguments about why uh, we have digital cash today and why we shouldn't have a CBDC. Uh, the point is that many, many countries are going for it and they can't all be misinformed or, uh, you know, obviously they know more than the guy who wrote that article, right? That, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, Bobby, no, what, do, what do you want to say, saying, Bobby? Right. My only point is I'm not trying to say digital currencies aren't a good thing. He was saying fundamentally that you have a lot of the aspects of that in M2 today. That's all. And to your point, there are some advantages, but most of it has to do with, in a sense, streamlining what I call the current banking system and payment systems big time, which are not necessarily all that efficient to your point. Yeah. I mean, if you have, go, go ahead, Bobby. Just when you were talking, Vipin, when you said something about um, this current crisis and trying to get thousands of dollars to all people and how those of us who are aware of the technology think that, you know, the digital wallet is a great idea for transferring value, but it's also just something that popped into my head while you were talking. Um, I know in New York when they had that big apps blockchain challenge that one of the things that they were striving for was to have that digital wallet um, be able to alert people for not only um, money, but services that there are available to them that they might not know of. So that that wallet isn't just uh, the idea, you know, apart from the central currency, the wallet itself has a powerful um, repercussions also. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, these emergent uh, uses is, is, you know, they are important, but in the end, okay, let's, let's uh, I mean, we can go on forever for talking about all this stuff, but let's talk about something concrete, like, you know, what, what are we doing? Uh, you know, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to settle this, these arguments today, obviously. So I would like to move the conversation on to what, what we are doing and we'll tell you uh, you know, what we have done so far and what challenges we are facing. So money is going to talk a little bit, I think, since he's uh, gotten off mute. Um, and then we go on to uh, the slides that I had prepared or slide that I had prepared. Mani, you want to say anything or? Yeah, yeah before, before we do that, can you show us the, the TTF work you have done? So that yes, that, that's exactly what I'm going to do in the slides. Okay, why don't you do that? Then we can use that as a basis for, for you know, what are we trying to achieve? So we need yeah, to um, so, you know, most of the slide, in the beginning of the slides are about, um, uh, you know, the if if you if you go to the um, to the meeting agenda, you'll see that there is a link to slides in the project, and uh, that's what I want to show right now. Okay, so I'm going to share again the screen. Okay. 
Am I sharing that? No, that's not good. I'm going to stop and make sure that I'm sharing the right screen. I've got 200 tabs open, so, you know, it's crazy. But you're right, the slide deck comes right off your meeting notes right now, so that's easy for everybody to grab it from there. Okay, so, you know, I'm not going to talk about um, what the rationale for the definition is and TTF uh, methods, you know, the abstraction layers of the TTF, the uh, you know, the team, at least the people who are registered as the team, uh, and the workshop flow, and what our token is, um, and why we chose that name, and the two choices are either it's a retail token, a retail CBDC or it is a wholesale CBDC. So the difference is that retail CBDC is just like cash, it's available to everybody, can be held in a wallet. Obviously it's a two tier system, just like in what the Chinese are saying, which is basically that we are going to have the central bank issue the currency and the currency will be a distributed just like cash through the uh, through the customer facing interface which is that which is the uh, regular banks so that imposes an additional layer uh, and also keeps the banking system just the way it is today with the deposits in the bank being con uh, possible to be converted to CBDC and back. The other is the wholesale CBDC, which means it's available only to the participants uh, or institutions with Fed accounts and with uh, secondary regulated institutions so that it can be used to do a settlement between them instead of uh, round tripping to the Fed uh, to adjust the reserves, which is how it is done today. That means if Citibank wants to transfer money to JP Morgan, they have to go to the Fed saying, transfer my reserve to JP Morgan. Uh, in this case, the settlement can happen between JP Morgan and uh, city without involving uh, without involving the fed obviously that means that the you know if citibank has to pay the fed they got to hold that much in cbdc in their institutional wallet which is what it means um and we had a debate and what should we do and all that but in the end, let's see, we are saying that we are looking at the, uh, the way in which the TTF goes from the formula to the implementation in Bezu. And I see that Dano is here, so obviously he can contribute. And money has been working hard on that part and he can say what he has done so far with 1155. But before that, I have to say that I created the formula inside the TTF, I mean EEA token taxonomy framework GitHub, which is private at the moment. And they did allow me access to it. So the formula is very simple. Let's, let's go for the formula. I mean, it looks complicated, but it's not. 
And here, Bobby, is the business description of it and the business example. So it first starts off with this. It's called a fungible token, right? TF. Um, somebody has posted something on chat. I can't look at it right now. If if you want to say what it is, I'd be glad to take a look at it. Um, TF is a fungible token. Okay, so what does a fungible token mean? Fungible just means that there is no specificity to the token. That means it's not like a diamond or a house, but it's like a dollar. In other words, one dollar equals, another, one physical dollar could be substituted by another physical dollar. That way it's fungible. There is no taint, that means you cannot say, okay, you cannot exchange this because it has come from some bad source. But we make sure that it doesn't come from a bad source with some other behaviors, which we will talk about in a minute. And it's variable supply, which means that it's not a fixed supply like an ICO type supply, which is, uh, issued using an ERC-20 or something. Um, so the supply can vary according to the Fed's control of the monetary policy. Uh, and uh, in today, the function is split between the Fed and the US Treasury. The minting of the, uh, of the uh, currency happens uh, under the control of the treasury, uh, but the supply is, con is controlled. In other words, you can also withdraw money from the supply, but that very rarely happens. A physical uh, dollars are burnt, but uh, uh, sometimes uh, more are printed uh, to replace them. And that that's, it depends on physical deterioration, not on anything else. But in this CBDC, we consider that, um, you know, basically the token can be minted or it can be burned, right? It is fractional, uh, which means that it is not a whole token, but it can be uh, divided into either decimals, or, um, uh, I mean, decimals, you can set up to four decimal points. Maybe we should, just like in Bitcoin, you know, it's a Satoshi is uh, up to nine, I think nine decimal points. But we say that we can probably set it to four if we need to uh, make real micro payments. Um, and they are also, so we have the D, which is the dividable token. And then we have the T, which is obviously the transferable uh, behavior. And then we have, uh, I'll, I'll skip over the P for now, and I'll go to C, which is compliant. So that means the burning and the mint operation check compliance, transferring uh, also can check some kind of a compliance regulation. Transferring, in this case, uh, according to FATF regulations, only amounts greater than 1,000 needs to have a KYC AML check. So we could bake that into the transfer protocol that a compliance kicks in when the uh, transfer amount is greater than 1,000. But in this case, we are modeling 
starting to model a wholesale uh, CBDC, um, you know, that uh, that may not require such a heavy compliance because the institutions are regulated. But it might require some kind of, uh, you know, further look into this, um, into the transfer operation, the amounts. The other is possible, but you know, most, most of the time, these kind of compliance operations can strike at the heart of fungibility because if you decide that some transfer is illegal and hence the tokens that uh, are uh, received as a result of that now become tainted for some reason uh, and so it it challenges that notion of fungibility then we have possible which is the p that we just skipped over possible is um, for possible freezing of movement and all other operations uh, because of discovered bugs or uh, upgrade of the infrastructure so you can pause and then you can resume uh, a particular account or a set of uh, tokens then we have this thing called sc which is nothing but supply control which which means mintable and burnable now the formula here is depicted like this but in the end inside the ttf it is a json file with which i've created and as far as my efforts there uh, i have built and run the to token service i mean taxonomy service and the TTF printer, and I've checked that my JSON works because the TTF printer is able to uh, parse that JSON document and come out with no errors. So as far as that goes, that's already there. Now I'm going to I, I was going to delve into the uh, into the uh, interfaces that each of these need implementation of interfaces, each of those behaviors. The behavior dividable needs an interface, uh, transferable needs an interface, and possible compliant, and so on. So, um, that is still in the works i've just started a page to do that but i'm working um, to get that detailed out but luckily for me the ttf already says what those behaviors need to implement as far as interfaces go um, and that's that's where I want to stop my, uh, you know, what I've done so far. I'm facing the final challenge here with the TTF because I have to use all of these uh, JSON files then to create user readable documents that detail every one of these things out, which means the use case now gets transformed from a business use case into a uh, specification, functional specification for implementation. Now I'll let uh, Money talk about the other end of things, which is the 1155 end of stuff. And I'm going to stop my share. Um, Ritin, do you have the PDF file generated or not yet? No, I'm facing uh, problems doing that. I'm in constant contact with 
Marley, and I got very far yesterday with respect to running the service and the printer, which are absolutely necessary for generating the PDF files. Um, and I hope to have them completed sometime this week. And obviously, I've had many distractions as we have all had. Um, so that's that's where I stand. But I have a fairly good idea of uh, what needs to be done. Uh, you know, it's getting clearer and clearer um, of what needs to be done. Uh, maybe about ten functions, and I I don't I didn't talk about roles. Uh, the intersection of roles with this, but uh, the roles are important because, for example, for Mintable, only the central bank or its uh, agents can mint the token. No one else can. And so is it with burn burnable. Only those people can burn. For transferable, it can only happen between uh, parties at this time in the wholesale system, between the parties that are. So identity enters, has to enter at the early stage. So I was at the Hypologic Global Forum and I was listening to a talk from the LEI, the Legal Entity Identity uh, Group, the Global Legal Entity Identity Foundation. Those guys had, has, had implemented using Indy or you know, the earlier forms of Indy, a organizational wallet that went from the uh, LEI, which is enterprise focused to role focused. That means if the Fed has someone called as chief mint officer, that chief mint officer is delegated that responsibility of minting. Maybe it needs a sign off by someone else and that chief uh, mint officer uh, officer's boss or his checker will have that role. So all of those roles had, you know, they had uh, created a POC with the organizational wallet that goes from the institution to the actual roles. Uh, and I had started to talk to them about this because it would be a great idea to integrate that role, role stuff into the uh, Ethala project so that we have end to end. And I think money will talk about how the far end of the process, the Ethala project will help the other side, which is asset transfers and settlement. Are you going to say anything about that money? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, picking it up from uh, what the Whitman had discussed, uh, the focus of the uh, initial phase is, is to build a basic uh, infrastructure uh, so a token could be issued by the central bank and few authorized parties in this case, uh, commercial banks. Um, um, can transfer these tokens amongst themselves. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the larger focus is this could also be eventually be evolved into retail functions. Um, and also, uh, we wanted to create a standard uh, on, the, um, on the contract side such that um, this could be eventually be uh, you know expanded into uh, commercial banks issuing uh, minting and issuing their own tokens as well. Although that's not the focus here, uh, but we wanted to keep all of this into consideration 
So we, we started looking at things, what standards should we apply, what networks we should use. Uh, and since this is our initial implementation is, you know, uh, enterprise. I, I, I want to interrupt there for a moment. Yeah. Uh, the retail token will not be issued by the commercial banks. Commercial banks will just be a conduit for them. Uh, yeah, no, no, we, I, we, we, I'm not addressing that at this point. It's just that it will be eventually this, this project could be extended to cover retail function. How it's going to be implemented, that we will have to you know, look at later on. Um, so with, with that in mind, uh, we looked at all the infrastructure and we decided to say, okay, we, to be really useful, we could use more of enterprise uh, related platforms, so we decided that we could uh, we would use the hyperledger base uh, with the privacy feature in, in, in incorporated. So that that would be our base for implementing uh, the token. Um, then with the token standard itself, uh, we we look at ERC twenty seven twenty one does not not applicable here, and we felt that ERC eleven fifty five being the newer or uh, later standard is a lot more uh, useful for one. A lot of these functions uh, are in 1155 is uh, part of a super set of 20. And also, um, a lot of these PTF related functions are already built in. Um, so we, we felt that uh, that would be useful. And second thing is that if, even for our own purposes of our exchanging, if, we, if, if there are multiple central banks are interested in receiving on a certain network, then the 1155 would be one contract uh, could be used um, to issue multiple uh, multiple currencies or multiple tokens, however you want to tool that. So uh, compared to an ERC20 where every con every token needs a different contract and that contract has to go through a whole approval process and, and uh, implemented um, and you need the whole uh, infrastructure to support. 1155, once it is vetted through and approved, then that contract could be used to issue uh, any number of different types of tokens. Um, so that, that could be useful uh, not only for central bank tokens, but also, as I said, if a commercial bank, they want to take it up and then build their own network using their own tokens, yes, you could use the same uh, infrastructure. Uh, we use Open Zeppelin uh, a very early uh, implementation or whatever the alpha stage implementation of 1155. We've taken that and we extended out and built an e-teller e uh, token. Um, we use Truffle and initially we used Ganache to test it out and, and now we are deploying it on the on a four node uh, base to uh, private network. Uh, our intention is uh, to in the next few weeks uh, start putting it out and put it into uh, open source uh, infrastructure so others, others can take it up and, and test it out amongst themselves. And also, uh, we would open up a test network for others also to test it out. So that's a very high level of what we are trying to accomplish. Obviously, our first cut is to be very focused. Uh, one currency, one central bank, a couple of uh, commercial banks being authorized to transfer the token. And you know, uh, as Ripping comes up with the more the refining functions, we will start adopting them as well. So this is the very gist of it. Uh, our intention is to come up with the first set of testing in, in a couple of weeks. Can you also connect it to the uh, asset side of things, the value transfer of um, and settlement? Um, I mean that's you know if you, if you, once you once you have the basis of a a, a, a central bank digital currency or you know, stable coin, then this is interesting. As I said, this network, this infrastructure could also be used by banks to issue their own tokens, and hence the, the, those tokens could then be settled using the CBDC token. So you really can create an ecosystem uh, for parties to. Uh, really subtle, uh, whether it is in a uh, real time gross, uh, real RTG as a real time gross settlement basis or a net basis. And that's another advantage to which we are to learn to supply too, which is if you are going to do on a net basis, there's a possibility that a, a, a set of tokens are exchanged simultaneously at the same time, uh, which is another advantage of the year to 
So, you know, from, an, from if you really look at the uh, enterprise level, um, banks, when they're settled, they're settling a lot of assets simultaneously, and this it, it helps them, instead of uh, doing one asset at a time, you could then settle multiple assets in one contract, one contract in the day. So, were you now talking about, you know, something like, let's say that if you, if you have a swap, or a derivative. Um, quick question, uh, Michael. Mike said that he's not able to hear. Is everyone able to hear so far? We had any questions? Yeah, that's the other thing. I mean, right now we can we can open it, open up the floor for questions uh, about any aspect of all this stuff. Do you guys have any questions? Hi, Vipin, it's Bobby. When you were referring to, let me just go back in my notes for a second. Um, you were saying you need interfaces for all of those, those variables. Um, are you collecting data points and information that would help develop what that flow for that would look like? Or is that what you need help with? No, we, uh, you know, the, the uh, TTF standard states clearly what each of those behaviors, in order to implement each of those behaviors, uh, like transferable, you need to be able to say, send token and receive token, right? In, or something like that. Uh, um, or send token. Uh, for possible, you need to say, pause all tokens, and then you need to be able to say resume. Uh, so those behaviors are well-defined in the uh, TTF. And the governance of those behaviors? It's not the governance. I mean, it is in order to implement this behavior, you got to implement this interface. Right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's what it means. So okay. money... Money currently has implemented the 1155 uh, stuff. But we will need to implement these interfaces as well. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody else wants to ask? Questions? Sorry, one, one, one quick uh, clarification. So uh, when Mani talked about, he you know he mentioned his, um, Hyperledger Besu, right, as a platform? Yes. Um, in, in, any specific reasons for picking up? I, I know that it's an Ethereum client, and uh, you know, as far as the tokens is concerned, that's the most stable. Uh, you know, are, are there any other reasons for picking uh, Besu? I'll let money answer that one. Um, the, the main reason is it, we wanted to have an enterprise um, standard uh, um, uh, network. That, that's why we chose this. It, it does not prevent you, you know, to implement on any other uh, hyperledger fabric or uh, any other, uh, you know, block in our DLT. Uh, we had to choose one, and we felt that because this is in any, again. It goes hand in hand with the TTF definition. Uh, that's also in an enterprise Ethereum standard. So, uh, it, it, for demonstration purposes, it makes a lot of sense uh, that we use an enterprise Ethereum uh, for, um, infrastructure to implement and, and demonstrate. Uh, and once we publish, it, you know, uh, anyone can take these and you know, adopt other platforms as well. Okay. Um, Bippin, one, Jim, one question. Um, in For wherever you are now at this point in testing anything, have you determined what a transaction time would be? No, 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 we're far away from all that. So um, do you, sorry, do you, I'll back it up then. Do you have a goal for that, for what a transaction time would be? Uh, no, I mean, you know, it obviously, uh, there were several models sketched out. One of them would be that uh, the wallets would be separate from the uh, blockchain, um, you know, uh, 
there was a model sketched out by the uh, consensus guys the, and the transaction times would be almost instantaneous uh, um, in that in that but not on the blockchain then right well yeah i mean but the blockchain yeah. is uh, taken as the uh, you know as the system of record and uh, the anchor basically i mean but which is not, which is the direction in which yeah, so it, in your model, it's not part of what I call the instant transaction then? It, it is. Uh, I mean, we haven't, uh, look, all we are saying is we have to implement these interfaces. Those are contracts. The implementation details, uh, you know, uh, that's why we are building in uh, Besu. And then we'll see what, you know, how we can separate. Uh, and look, first of all, the creation of a um, digital wallet, especially something that like what Bobby was suggesting, is a non-trivial task. You know, it's it's going to take a long time to develop a very secure digital wallet. It is a very significant piece of work. Uh, our yeah. intention, right? Our intention is not to focus on the uh, on like. Uh, deliverables like a transaction time at this point, obviously it has to be usable. I mean, you can't make a payment to a coffee shop of $2 and then wait for, uh, you know, 20 minutes hanging out in the coffee shop, especially today. You got to get out of there fast. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, you know, these will enter the picture. And uh, most likely, it will be a layer two solution. Uh, in fact, in the uh, in the consensus uh, paper on CBDC, uh, there were four layers. So yeah, that's the point. So arch so you're right. So it would help conceptually, I think, to just um, I'll call it visually define the layers you logically expect it doesn't mean that they'll stay that way because you're right your implementation could change everything as you move forward but at least up front to say hey here's the visual layers we expect to be using and how they would work and then the only other thing i'll say is and it seems reasonable is wallets like real wallets in real life don't hold a lot right they hold a limited amount of things they hold some identities they hold, may hold some in a sense uh i'll call it currencies of different types let's say but in a sense most of your assets the same thing for the company aren't sitting in any wallet right so it's a multi-tiered system in effect you wind up with where the actual assets or the representation of those assets is held somewhere else and the wallet is only holding in a sense what you're expecting to use in some limited amount of time and the general reason for that is the security of a wallet is not as good as what i call some other store that is i'll call it more secure right so architecturally, in a sense, I, I'm thinking we have a, a, an application that runs using um, wallets, ERC-20 wallets, but they're limited in terms of what you're going to put into the wallet. So you're moving assets from some other place into the wallet. In our case, the network has, um, we didn't use. Um, yeah, theory. but Jim, let, yep. let me, let me, uh, let me cut short that uh, sure. for, for a minute. Uh, what I'm saying is, we don't need to be constrained by actual physical wallet structure today, especially if the wallets uh, gain in strength and uh, security. So we don't know what the emergent effects of wallets could be. The physical wallet has a, uh, has a uh, limitation. Uh, it, you know, you can't hold a million dollars in your wallet, uh, but, an organizational wallet could hold potentially millions of dollars uh, or even, you know, it's frictionless to hold a trillion dollars in a wallet. Today, you cannot do <laughs> so, it. You cannot right, do it into its physical right. currency. Right, so it would help also if you listed the assumptions at the front end of how you see this thing working, because you're what you just defined is an assumption that a wallet can be 100% secure all the time and that IBM- No, no, no. That thing is going to be 100% secure all the time. But is there a way of recovering? Is there a way of saying, yeah, you know, there was a problem with the wallet. 
and it's going to happen over time, just like anything else. You know, it may not right off with a bang, start off with a bang with the wallet holding a trillion dollars, but over time, you know, it may end up, I mean, the, the Fed is holding reserves of trillions of dollars, right? How do they do it? They're doing it in a digital digital way. They, there's no physical cash held in the Fed. Correct. Uh, oh, they they obviously are very secure. They're very sure that that stuff is not going to be uh, hackable by just uh, Tom, Dick, and Harry, right? I, I mean, right, right. The, the, so already we have examples of that. Of, right, so to your uh, point. Digital currency that, being held by right. institutions that Amount, amount to trillions. Um, so Right, so to clarify, it's not really a wallet, it's a wallet system that you're talking about then. Well, I mean, you know, what is a wallet? You know, you're, I, I we, mean, are, we, are, we don't have that, to have physical analogies for everything. Uh, and we shouldn't be constrained. There's a difference. Right, all I'm arguing is it helps, because I've got the same problem in the stuff we're doing, is it helps to clarify by separating the logical concepts, as you say, from the implementation concepts. And the implementation, to your point, can certainly vary over time. But I've got ex we all have the same problem. So grabbing an ERC-20 wallet in Fabric or something and creating a wallet and dumping tokens and identities into it, that's mechanical. And that's a physical implementation of something. But to your point, it helps to define logically, separately, what you're trying to look at as concepts with the idea that the implementation can vary. That's my only point. All right, thank you. So I think we are at time, unless you guys have uh, something else um, to talk about. We always, you know, Karen, uh, actually we do sometimes continue over if there is, uh, uh, you know, we are not backing into somebody else. Uh, and anyway, so there you go. Um, if you have anything else to add, let it be the let it be the time now, and we're going to close the call soon. So. This is Michael speaking. Um, I just wanted to uh, drop my email here in the um, the group chat. Uh, yeah, I'm connected with almost any everybody here, um, and have had some great conversations with you all over the years. But there are a couple people um, who I don't know. Um, and if you would ever like to chat, uh, I'm happy to speak on background as I am always learning. Um, but also, of course, if you have any developments you wanted to share on the record, I'm here as well. Uh, thank you guys all so much for your work and for uh, doing this in such an open and transparent way. I think it's important, not only to me as a reporter, but to the world. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you uh, for those kind words. Natalia, sorry, uh, this is one more of those days where uh, where the time is against your conception of it. Sorry, uh, I made I thought I made it clear, but anyway, uh, we're going to call close the call. Thank you. Thanks, Ethan.